Hi everyone, my name is Joanna Lorenz and representative of all authors. Today I'm going to present you the paper that we developed at Pizzai Research and submitted to this workshop where we dealt with machine learning methods to detect money laundering in the Bitcoin blockchain in the presence of labor scarcity. I'm going to start with a brief introduction on the company, the problem statement and our research objectives. Fizai is a leader in the financial crime detection market, and we develop and deploy state-of-the-art machine learning solutions in order to detect financial crime in our clients' data in real time. We offer an all-in-one platform solution where we combine multiple use cases of financial crime, such as transaction fraud, identity theft, and anti-money laundering. And we also have a very strong research focus in order to always offer best-in-class solutions to our clients. We're also highly dedicated to offer our clients an effective AML solution. Money laundering in general is a highly relevant problem for economies all around the world and regulations are increasingly tightening. Especially cryptocurrencies in re recent years have developed as a haven for illegal activity in this specific context. Machine learning has a very strong potential for AML because it's able to find very complex patterns in data, but it would also be able to overcome the simplicity of the regulatory rule sets. However, labels in real-life data sets are extremely scarce. That's because the data is very sensitive, but also just because of the complexity of labeling for money laundering. This leads to a very heterogeneous scattered research landscape and to results being very inconclusive. But it also means that supervised methods in general are inapplicable in a practical AML setting because we just can't rely on having a thoroughly labeled data set. So the research objective for us in order to move closer to an efficient and practical AML setting was to benchmark methods that require either no labels or just a few labels and benchmark them in a real life labeled cryptocurrency data set. And we're comparing our result against a supervised baseline in order to see the trade-offs between the number of labels that we have and our classifier performance. The data set that we are using is one that was released by a company called Elliptic last year in this exact workshop, and it represents a fully anonymized transaction graph from the Bitcoin blockchain at each of 49 different time steps. We have about 46,000 label transactions, 10% illicit and 90% illicit, where the labeling indicates whether the initiating entity of a transaction belongs to an illicit or illicit category. Illicit in this case, something like malware, terrorist organizations, and so on where illicit represents verified wallet providers, miners, and services. In total, we have 166 features, of which we know that 94 are local information and 72 are aggregated information. However, because the metadata was removed, we don't know exactly what these features are. Let's get to the experiments. We started with a supervised baseline. So the elliptic paper already did supervised experiments, and now we also did something like that by applying three different supervised classifiers. In our case, that was XGBoost, Logistic Regression, and Random Forest. And we can see that here in the test set up to time step 42, especially Random Forest in terms of the illicit F1 is performing well. Then there was a black market shutdown that was acknowledged by the elliptic paper. So in general, we were able to reproduce the results of the elliptic paper and we continue to use these results as our, uh, our baseline for the future experiments. And then we started experimenting with unsupervised learning. Um, and we used anomaly detection methods uh, and we did that for two reasons. First of all, it is realistic to assume that money laundering, just like fraud, exhibits different characteristics from normal transactions. And the other reason is that research had already frequently applied these kind of methods and they uh, presented good detection rates and those false positive rates, mostly in synthetic AML data sets, where they artificially created the, the uh, anomalous instances. So we benchmarked seven anomaly detection methods that basically aim at finding unexpected behavior in the data using the same train test split that we also used for the supervised baseline for better comparison. And then we are comparing all these methods by contamination levels. This is because all these methods return different scores and metrics and we wanted to have it comparable. And the contamination level indicates the proportion of outliers that we expect in the test set and is set as a threshold on the decision function. And in a real life setting, it would represent the alert rates so of the number of cases that we are alerting as suspicious. However, as you can see here on the right in our results table, all seven anomaly detection methods are performing extremely poorly, especially when compared to the random forest supervised baseline. 
So at this point, we had to conclude that our anomaly detection methods seem unable to appropriately classify the instances that we have in this data set, which was something that contradicted with everything that we had seen in the research, where in synthetic data, these methods seem to be performing well. So in order to find out why this was the case, we did a visual exploration of our data. And we did this by transforming our data using UMAP, which is the dimensionality reduction technique. And here we are showing our test set in two dimensions, and we are coloring it on the left um, by the predictive label from our worst performing anomaly detection method, the isolation forest. And on the right, we're covering, uh, coloring it by the true label. And what we can see here is that the isolation forest seems to be catching the outliers as it should and labeling them as illicit. However, the true label shows that the illicit cases are not actually the outliers, but rather they're hidden in this dense region of illicit activity. So we could conclude that even though our anomaly detection methods do successfully find outliers, the anomalies that we are looking for, so the illicit um, behavior, is not actually outlying in this data set. This is why this is not working. So we were now in this position where we had poor performance with unsupervised anomaly detection methods, assuming no labels at all. And then we had good performance with supervised classifiers, but here we were dependent on a large set of labeled instances. And now because we're looking at a practical AML setting, we were wondering if we assume a limited capacity for manual labeling, because we have human experts available in, to, to review transactions, we were wondering how many labels do we need in order to achieve a performance that is similar to the supervised baseline. And in order to find that out, we used active learning. And active learning is a concept where we try to achieve a similar performance to supervised learning, but with a much smaller set of labeled data. And we do this by sampling only a small set of informative instances for labeling so that the algorithm can learn much faster. And the specific setup that we have here is that the train set uh, starts being unlabeled. So we assume that we have no labels at all in the train set. And then we sample a few instances via a query strategy for labeling. And then they go into the label pool. Now we train a machine learning algorithm on the label pool and we evaluate it on the test set. And if the performance is not satisfactory, we can repeat this process until the entire train set is labeled. In our case, the labeling worked by using the labels that we have and appending them to the queried instances. In a real life setting, this would be done by human analysts, for example. The query strategies that we used are four, and two of them are supervised. That means they rely on a supervised model that is trained on the labeled pool and evaluated on the unlabeled pool in order to pick the instances. And then we have two unsupervised methods, which basically are anomaly detection methods based on the labeled pool. So we're trying to make the labeled pool more heterogeneous. The results that we present show that uh, even with a very small number of labels, we can reach the performance of the supervised baseline. So we can see here that the random forest classifier in red using active learning can achieve its uh, supervised baseline with only about 5% of the total labels, which is about 1500 compared to the 30,000 that we used in the supervised baseline. However, something that we saw is that even if we use random sampling at each iteration, we get similar results, so a similar improvement of performance very quickly. And we were wondering now why this is the case. Our hypothesis is that because we have this 10% illicit rate, which is pretty high in a, in a money laundering setting, we can build a labeled pool with an appropriate amount of positive instances, even if we use random sampling at each iteration. However, because again, we are looking at a practical setting, we were wondering what happens if we set the data set imbalance to a much more realistic percentage. So we looked at active learning if we have an illicit rate of 2% or 0.5%. And we can see that at the illicit rate of 2% versus 0.5%, we can see that active learning in red increasingly outperforms random sampling in blue. So we can uh, conclude that with an increasing data set imbalance, which is much more realistic in a practical setting, active learning, so using much more sophisticated strategies than random sampling, increasingly outperforms it. In terms of re future research, it's important to look at class distribution in other real life data sets and for other labeling strategies to find out if this class distribution that we found in this data set also holds for others. And then we should also look at the structure of money laundering and other verticals, such as bank transfers, deposits, and so on, in order to see how the findings of this research could be applied to other financial um, transaction use cases. Thank you so much for your time and see you soon.